this is the last week before before spring break. So we have two lectures. We're going to finish uh, chapter five, and I guess we're going to start chapter six. Um, the exam. We're going to design it just like last time. You know, you, you're going to pick the problems uh, that you want. Or I'll get similar ones uh, on Monday, you know, right after spring break. So that means that the exam, exam number two, is going to cover, um, you know, from where we left off last time, well, for the previous exam, um, through homework number eight, problem set eight, which will be posted on Wednesday. So the exam is going to cover chapters four and five, essentially. Um, and yeah, I guess that's it. Any questions or comments? I think I will hold a, a review session that week, so the week after a spring break. Okay, so let's start. So last time we uh, ended up uh, deriving uh, this equation. This is not as good to write, but let's see. So it's the pressure or the density. They're the same thing. So the pressure at some height h of the atmosphere or a atmosphere is equal to the pressure at uh, the ground and then the exponent of minus mgh, which is the potential energy you know, from your intro mechanics class uh, divided by the temperature. So this is kind of cool. It is the Boltzmann um, equation. Again, well, the Boltzmann factor over here. And what it tells you is that this is the, the pressure over here. It's a function of H. This will be the height H. Then it is going to look like a negative exponential. And the factors that, that matter are the mass of the gas, the uh, acceleration due to gravity, G, and the, the temperature. So if you have two gases or two atmospheres with the same composition, a different temperature, you know, one might look like this, and the other one might look kind of like that. And I think this is kind of cool. Like, um, if you remember, uh, what is the name of this? New Horizons, so the the craft, the uh, spacecraft that went to Pluto, it discovered that it has an atmosphere that depending on whether it is the summer or the winter, and of course they're very long uh, over there, the atmosphere collapses completely. So it becomes a, a solid, right? It gets so cold. And in the summer, it has a, a pretty tenuous, but still uh, real atmosphere. 
So, you know, that was kind of really cool, uh, unexpected. So, uh, if you have, you know, to a pretty good approximation, if you have several gases, let's say, um, you know, hydrogen. So hydrogen is very light, so it will look kind of like that. And then if you have maybe nitrogen, so this will be like our atmosphere, it will look kind of like this. Uh, then that means that you're going to have a fraction of the of the hydrogen that is really far away. And you know they do interact to a certain extent, but they also have curves that look uh, like that. So the hydrogen, you know, it's it can go high enough that uh, the solar wind can wash it off. And that's why the, uh, I guess the inner planets, you know, like Mercury, Venus, there's not a lot of hydrogen uh, in the atmosphere. But if you go to the gas giants, right, like uh, Jupiter and Saturn, you definitely have a lot of hydrogen. Uh, even if you go to like, well, not if you go, but if you look at um, like Neptune, uh, and Uranus, uh, they're, they don't have that much hydrogen uh, in their atmospheres. They are big, but not that big. So a, a lot of their, uh, of, of their atmosphere is methane, uh, methane and heavier, heavier gases, water and all this stuff. So this is a kind of a cool application uh, of, um, of Gibbs that we will see in a little bit. Okay, so well Gibbs slash chemical potential. So consider a system that is in thermodynamic and diffusive equilibrium with a reservoir at constant volume. So we have, just like before, we have our reservoir over here. Um, make a little reservoir. And the system that is attached to the reservoir. And so the volume is constant, the, the volume of um, the system and the volume of the reservoir. But there is a, a third element. So you can consider this like some uh, insulating material. So now this whole thing is uh, insulated from Question? And so we do this so that the, the total energy, you see the, sorry, uh, gas particles. So the, the total energy is conserved just like before. Uh, but also the total number of particles is conserved just like before, but now they, it can vary. So they can go from the reservoir to, to the system. But the total number of particles is conserved. Okay, so this is our pictorial representation. So the entropy of this 
construction is a function of the energy, the volume, and the number of particles in general. So the total derivative of the entropy is going to be a partial derivative of the entropy with respect to u, keeping v and n constant, du, plus partial derivative of the entropy with respect to the volume, keeping u and n constant, dv, plus partial derivative of the entropy with respect to the number of particles, keeping energy and volume constant, dn. And so we're saying that this is at constant volume. So dv you know, is zero. So we can uh, forget about that term. And this is equation 5.31 in Tell and Cromer. So now if the system is in thermal equilibrium, d tau is equal to zero. But another way to, to write mathematically, to ma mathematically express this idea that d tau is zero, we can say that if there's a small change delta in the entropy, sigma, at constant temperature, so that means that dt is zero, um, then we can uh, it will also imply that the u, small change in the energy at constant uh, temperature. And so then the delta sigma, small change in entropy is gonna be the derivative of sigma with respect to u at constant n, you know, the v is still there, but it's zero. So we don't have to worry about writing it. And then this du is a small change in u at constant temperature. Plus this one will be a constant u. And this is a small change in n at constant temperature. So that one is equation 5.32. So we can divide everything by n, small change in n. I'll put it over here. Okay, so now this one is equal to one and we have this uh, other two. So this is equal to one, let's forget about it. And this one over here is the derivative, I mean, is the definition of the temperature. So that whole thing is one over tau. So we can write that instead. And so um, this one's are small changes at constant temperature. Both of them are small changes. 
both of them are at constant temperature. So we can rewrite them as delta sigma with respect to n at constant temperature. And, and this one also, so that will be change in energy with respect to n at constant temperature. Cool. So then uh, this implies that we can put the, I'm gonna move it over here a little. So sigma with n at constant tau, we can multiply the whole thing times tau. And so we get rid of this one. Uh, and over here we have this, this other term. Okay, so this one, we're going to keep it in mind. We're gonna need it. So I'm gonna write it up here so we don't forget about it. Keep it up there. Okay, so I guess it should be the other way. You don't need to see it right now. You just need to remember it. Okay, so that was the first one. So now, for the next derivation, the free energy is the internal energy minus tau sigma. So the definition that we had of the chemical potential was the change in the free energy with respect to the number of particles at constant tau and volume, right? And so we know what the free energy is. So then the chemical potential is the change in the internal energy with respect to the number of particles, constant temperature and volume minus tau change in the entropy with respect to, uh, forgive me a second. Okay, sorry about that. 
Um, so uh, Delta Sigma. with tau and volume constant. This one is equation 5.34. Okay, so that means that tau delta sigma with respect to n at constant temperature and volume is equal to minus the chemical potential plus the change in the internal energy with respect to the number of particles at constant temperature and volume. OK, so now we have this one over here. And this one over here, the one that we derived before. So both are tau, partial derivative of the entropy with respect to the number of particles. And well, here we assume that the volume was constant. So we can rewrite it um, explicitly. So that means that these two quantities are the same. So negative chemical potential change in the internal energy with respect to N at constant temperature and volume is equal to this one plus uh, tau derivative of sigma with respect to n at constant temperature and volume. So we have this one and this one on both sides of the equation. So we can get rid of them. and write it like that. Okay, so I want to give this uh, equation the attention that it deserves. So I'm gonna write it again over here. So the chemical potential is equal to negative of the temperature, the product of the temperature, partial derivative of the entropy with respect to the number of particles at constant temperature and volume. So this is equation 5.35. And it is kind of cool. What is the definition of temperature? One word temperature is what? Is entropy divided by change in entropy. Change in entropy divided by energy. Is that a Maxwell Maxwell identity? A Maxwell relation? Um probably. I mean Maxwell relations are everything. <laughs> I mean it's it's just um you can relate pretty much any thermodynamic variable to any other one. But the, the interesting thing to notice about this is that the temperature tells you, or it's related, right? It's inversely proportional to how the entropy changes when you change the energy. And the chemical potential, you do have this temperature here which makes it more complicated. But at constant temperature, because it's constant over here, 
the chemical potential is how the entropy changes when you change the, uh, the number of particles, right? So the, the, the definitions really are, are analogous. And so for uh, the temperature, you, know, you, you have thermal contact and thermodynamic equilibrium. For the chemical potential, you have diffusive contact and uh, diffusive equilibrium. Right, so those are kind of the two main uh, things that you can vary in a system, the energy and, uh, and the number of particles. Okay, so um, I need the space, so you know, this, is, uh, this is a good one to remember, as important as the temperature. So the equation that we wrote at the very beginning, the total derivative of the entropy, it was the change in the, okay, so let me, I can do it again. It was entropy as a function of the energy, the number of, the volume and the number of particles. So the total derivative, derivative of sigma with respect to internal energy, constant V and N, uh, du plus derivative of entropy with respect to the volume, constant U and N, dV plus derivative of the entropy with respect to the number of particles, constant U and V, the N, okay? So this one over here, the change in the entropy with respect to the energy, that is one over tau. Uh, this one over here, the change in the entropy with respect to the volume. I don't know if you remember it. I, I derived it uh, from the thermodynamic identity, um, I don't know, like a month ago. So if you go to page 40 of my notes, you will find it. This is the pressure divided by the temperature. And this one, the change in the entropy with respect to N is the new quantity that we just derived. So this one is negative chemical potential divided by the temperature. Okay, so we can rewrite the total derivative of the entropy as one over tau um, du plus pressure divided by tau dv minus chemical potential divided by tau dn. We have the temperature in every each one of the terms. So we can put it over here. Right. And so this is equation 5.38. And if you want to put it in a more canonical form, du the change in the internal energy. It's gonna be tau 
d sigma minus p dv. And this is what we had used before. This was our thermodynamic identity. But now we can add this term. And now it is more complete. Okay. So taking the appropriate derivative, you can get whatever quantity that you need, right? So that's why I've never even attempted to memorize the Maxwell relations because they just it's just they come from these. I'm taking the the appropriate derivative. So this is equation five point thirty nine. Question? Beautiful. Yes, it is beautiful. So, you know, some other stuff to observe here. Uh, temperature is uh, an intensive variable. So it doesn't change if you increase the size of the system. Uh, pressure is the same. Chemical potential is the same. So they are intensive variables. The entropy increases with the size of the system, the volume increases with the size of the system and the number of particles increases. So these are uh, extensive variables. So they always come in pairs, right? Uh, intensive and, and extensive. So you can see the, the temperature, the pressure and the chemical potential play analogous roles, right? So, you know, in a way, um, the pressure and temperature are, are potentials also, in a way, in the sense that, um, you know, a gas, for example, is going to expand so that the pressure is the same. So it's going to go from a high pressure state to a low pressure state. So it's going to go from a high chemical potential state to a low chemical potential state. And temperature wants to go from a high temperature to a, to a low temperature, right? Heat flows uh, from high temperature to low temperature. So these are, this is a cool relationship. Okay, so. So the new dn is du minus tau d sigma um, plus pdv. Can you still see it? Yes. So the variables are u, sigma, and volume. So if you let uh, sigma and volume constant then you get that the chemical potential is the change in the energy with respect to the number of particles at constant sigma and volume. And we can put the other ones in there. Tau derivative of sigma with respect to n at constant sigma and volume, but because this is constant, this whole thing is zero. And same thing with the other one, right? So the P dvdn sigma and volume. So this one is zero, so the whole thing is zero. So then the 
relationship is this one. All right, so if you keep sigma and, and volume constant, then the chemical, so this is a, um, an adiabatic uh, process. And the change in the uh, energy when you change the number of particles is the, the chemical potential. And I think that's kind of uh, intuitive. So if you let, um, U and B, U and V uh, constant, then this one is zero. Mm, this one is zero and the chemical potential is this, uh, which is the one that we got before. So the, the derivative, partial derivative of the entropy with respect to N. And this will be uh, an isochoric uh, adiabatic um, process. And then for the third one, if you let the uh, internal energy and the entropy be constant. So you, over here, you can change the volume. Then these two are going to be zero. And the chemical potential is a partial derivative of the volume with respect to N times the pressure. Right, so um, all of these relationships, we're getting them from the thermodynamic identity, and we can just summar summarize summarize them. Um, okay. Yes. The, the chemical potential we define as the energy that the particle will have once it leaves the system. Mm. Uh, I guess so. So if you leave, if, if you let one particle out of your system, then that is going to be the change in energy of your, of your, of your system, right? So yes, I mean, we, from conservation of, of energy. That's a good way to, to think about it. So this is figure table, sorry, table 5.1. Mm, this is just new. So this is similar to what I, well, this is a uh, you know, summary of what I derived before. So if you look at page 40 of my notes, but now it is, um, extended, so sigma, the entropy, U, V, N, the internal energy, sigma, V, N, and the free energy, tau, V, N. So from the entropy, you get the definition of, of temperature. It's the partial derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy at constant V and N. And then over here, you get pressure divided by the temperature is the partial derivative of the entropy with respect to the volume. And uh, there'll be constant energy and number of particles. And the chemical potential 
uh, minus mu over tau. That will be the derivative, partial derivative, derivative of the entropy with respect to the number of particles. That will be constant energy and volume. So you, you can just rearrange the thermodynamic variables and get the different quantities, um, as I mentioned before. So over here we get you know, tau, partial derivative of the energy with respect to sigma. It's just the inverse minus the pressure partial derivative of the energy with respect to volume. So you, know, you can change this variable. Um, this one, you keep the, the volume and we're here, keep the n, the number of particles. Uh, sorry, this is not sigma, this is u. And this is the definition of chemical potential and so on. Right? So you can also do negative pressure is the partial derivative of the free energy with respect to the volume. And this one is also the chemical potential, partial derivative of the free energy with respect to the number of particles. So here you're gonna have constant tau and N constant tau and B. So yeah, as I mentioned before, everything is related to everything else. You cannot change one thermodynamic variable without changing all of them. All right. So now we're going to repeat everything, every single step. that we follow to derive the Boltzmann factor, but we're going to add the chemical potential part to it. So this is uh, Gibbs factor and Gibbs sum. So Willard Gibbs, um, he got the first PhD in engineering awarded by an American institution. Uh, I think he got his PhD from Yale in like, I don't know, 18, um, probably like 1860s, 1850s maybe even. So, uh, Willard Gibbs, uh, Boltzmann, and Maxwell uh, are kind of the three main figures, you know, in the development of of uh, statistical mechanics. And in fact, Gibbs was the person who uh, first called this this science statistical mechanics. And he was like you know, incredibly talented. Um, Einstein said that Gibbs was like the most important American scientist, which is true. Um, you know, the US was not a scientific powerhouse uh, in the 1800s. Um, of course, after, uh, well, during World War II that changed. Okay, so we have again our construction with the reservoir over here, reservoir system, and it is isolated. So the number of particles and the energy remains the same. So before we consider a system that was in thermodynamic equilibrium with the reservoir, now we consider a system that is in thermodynamic and diffusive equilibrium with the reservoir. So uh, 
total number of particles. And total energy. are conserved. When the system has n particles, mm, sorry, I guess this is a I made it sound like it was a continuation, but this is a period. So total number of particles and total energy is conserved. When the system has n particles, then reservoir has how many? Say n not minus n. This part is new, the part that was there before when the system has energy E, then the reservoir has energy what? E not minus E. Right. Okay, so before we specified a state, uh, based only on its energy, but now a state, state uh, S is specified by the energy of state N and the state, this is not the best notation, but I think it, um, gives the right idea. The state depends on the number of particles. Okay, so state depends on energy E and number of particles N. So the multiplicity of the reservoir plus system mm, I mean, this is a system, right? Um, construction, reservoir plus system construction is equal to the multiplicity of the reservoir plus, I mean, times the multiplicity of the system. So if we hold, if we specify the energy and the number of particles of the system, then what is going to be the multiplicity? Can you repeat that? Yes. You have the multiplicity of the reservoir and the multiplicity of the system. If you specify the number of particles and the energy of the system, what is the multiplicity of the system? If you specify N and E, how many states do you are available to G? I mean, to, to S, to the system. One, you're specifying the state. So this is equation five point forty one. This one over here. So in this situation, the multiplicity of the reservoir is equal to the multiplicity of the reservoir and system construction. Okay, so What is the probability hmm. 
I have to be careful with my piece over here. So this is the probability that the system is in state N and ES, but S depends on N. All the probability is going to be proportional to the multiplicity. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Yeah, the more states are available to this particular state of the system, the more likely is that the system is going to be in that state. So if we want to get rid of the uh, proportionality sign over there in the relationship, then we can say that the probability that the state is in the system specified by N1 and E1 divided by the ratio, I mean, divided by the probability that is in state N2, E2, um, that is the multiplicity, Actually, I should put the n first. It doesn't matter, but just to be consistent, because we have the n over here. So n not minus n one, u not minus e one. N not minus n two, u not minus e two. Right? Does that look familiar? Yes. We did it before, right? We did it with only this part, with the U, uh, but without the, the N. So this is equation um, 5.43. So we're going to repeat exactly the steps that we did before. So if we take the exponent of the natural log, then we end up with the same thing. Um, I'm going to call this the multiplicity of the reservoir because, well, it is the multiplicity of the reservoir. We only need to know the multiplicity of the reservoir to know the multiplicity of the whole construction. So this is going to be multiplicity of the reservoir mm -hmm. Right, so we can rewrite this thing as, remember that this is still the ratio of the probabilities. So it's gonna be the exponent, um, natural log of the multiplicity is just the entropy, right? So natural log, of the multiplicity n not minus n1 u not minus e1 um, it is this one is positive this one is negative minus natural log of the multiplicity
Okay. So that is the entropy. of the reservoir. And if we defined delta sigma r, so the change in the uh, entropy when the state moves from one state to the other as this exactly. Then the ratio of the probabilities is the exponent of the change in the entropy. And this one is equation 5.46. So do you remember how we proceed from here? So the Taylor expansion about sigma r of n not you not. So in general, the Taylor expansion is, is A, just a constant A. Getting confused with one half of a squared second derivative and so on, right? So this one is equation again. 3.6. So then we can rewrite, we can Taylor expand. It's going to be sigma r of n naught minus n u naught minus e1. It's going to be equal to sigma r of n naught u naught. And then uh, now this function is a function of two variables of n and of e, uh, energy and number of particles. So that is a little bit different from what we had before. So this is gonna be minus N1 derivative of sigma uh, with respect to N sigma R. And that's gonna be at N equals N not minus E1 derivative of sigma with respect to the energy.
uh, plus one half and one squared second derivative of the entropy with respect to n plus one half of E1 squared partial derivative of sigma with respect to U. Yeah, plus everything else. So we have a term that looks exactly the same as this one for, um, this is N1, for N, uh, N2, E2, um, except that in one of them was positive and then the other one was negative. And so several of these terms are going to go away. We're gonna get another one that is equal to these, right? So we can get rid of that one. And this one's the, the second derivatives. So this is gonna be the second derivative. It's gonna be the derivative with respect to N of the derivative of the entropy uh, with respect to n, right? And so uh, this one is negative chemical potential divided by tau. So if the system is large enough, just like we did before, this uh, out here is a extensive property. So this one in increases, or well, the DN increases uh, with size, but this one is a constant, it's an intensive uh, quantity. So we can, in the you know large system limit, we can forget about the second derivatives and higher order terms. The other one was um, derivative with respect to the energy of one over tau. So again, we have an intensive and an extensive, so we can ignore them. And this term over here, partial derivative of the entropy with respect to N is minus chemical potential divided by tau. And this one is one over tau. Okay, so when we put both of them together, so sigma r, well, actually this is just delta sigma r. We're gonna get um, negative and negative positive. So mu divided by tau n1. And we're gonna get another one. Um, well, let's put this one in there first. So this one is minus uh, e one over the over tau. For the other one, the there's an additional negative, so it's going to be minus mu n two divided by tau plus e two divided by tau. So then the sigma, I'm going to remove this part so that we don't get confused. Delta sigma of the reservoir is equal to N1 
minus N2 times the chemical potential, mu, divided by tau, minus uh, E1. Then we put another negative in there to make it positive, E2, divided by the temperature. So this one is equation 5.51, okay? So the ratio of N1, E1 divided by N2, E2 is the exponent of mu, um, well, N1 mu, doesn't matter, but I wanna put it like in the book, minus E1, uh, this is gonna be divided by tau, This is N2 mu minus E2, all of that divided by tau, okay? So this one deserves a box around it. This is equation 5.52. Uh, this part over here is the Gibbs factor. So the Boltzmann factor, e to the negative e over tau, when we add the number of particles and the potential, e to the n mu minus e divided by tau, this is the, the Gibbs factor. Um, Kittel says about this result that it is the central result of statistical mechanics. And this is pretty much, pretty much the most general expression that you can uh, come up with, right? So if you assume that the, that the chemical potential is zero, then you recover Boltzmann. So it includes Boltzmann in it. So uh, Willard Gibbs derived this for the first time. He called it the grand canonical distribution. So remember that The sum of all probabilities must be equal to one. That is our zeroth moment. So the sum from n equals zero to infinity, the sum of all the states s that depend on n exponent of uh, n mu minus e s of n divided by tau is equal to script z. Okay, so to resemble the other z, the partition function. But it's a little bit more general than the partition function because it includes the number of particles. So this one is equation 
5.53. Um, another way to write this is sum over all states and number of particles, ASN. Just means that you have those two sums. And um, this is called the, the Gibbs sum or the grand sum because it comes from the grand canonical ensemble or the grand partition function. Up to you how you want to call it. Uh, it is analogous to the partition function uh, when we only had thermodynamic equilibrium. So then the probability of getting state N1, E1 is exponent of N mu minus or N1 mu E1 divided by tau, which is the, the Gibbs factor. And we divide it by the total number of states available, right? So by the um, the the grand partition function. So this one is equation five point fifty four. So everything is analogous to what we did before, but now we are adding uh, the chemical potential slash number of particles. So let's do one more thing in the next few minutes. So sum over all the particles and all the states. Uh, probability of N and E, E depends on the state. And you know, we just saw it is the exponent, so the Gibbs factor, N, N mu minus E S, over tau, right? But this is the definition of the partition function, the gram partition. So this is equal to one over Z times uh, Z, script Z. So this is equal to one as expected. So the partition function, the gram part, the Grand partition function uh, normalizes uh, the probabilities. And so this probability is normalized. So we can use the definitions that we used before, for example, for the expectation value. We can get a kind of cool expectation value, which is the thermal average of the number of particles. That's going to be the sum over all states and number of particles, you have n and probability of n and e, um, es. All right, so this is The probability is the Gibbs factor n mu minus e s divided by tau. Um, this whole thing divided by the grand partition. And the derivative with respect to mu of the um, uh, grand partition 
derivative with respect to mu of the sum over all states and numbers. Uh, we have the Gibbs, right? So uh, the energy part doesn't depend on mu, so we can take it out. And then we just take the derivative of what remains inside. So the number of particles, so this derivative is going to be equal to, I'm going to write it. One over tau. We're taking the derivative with respect to mu, so we have an extra n that appears over there. Like that. So we can express the thermal average of the number of particles as tau derivative with respect to mu of um, C, which is this part. And then we have this one over here, right? So I guess I can put it over here so that it's more clear. So this is the um, logarithmic derivative. So this is one over tau derivative of the natural log of the gram partition with respect to the chemical potential. So this is equation 5.59. So we can get you know similar equations to what we got with Boltzmann, but Gibbs uh, extends uh, expands on that. All right, I'm going to end over here. Any questions or anything? <laughs>